uh, so today's class is on uh, the Tissa Sutta. Um, the uh, the personal nature of the sutta is remarkable, um, and again, like most suttas, the depth of teaching that's included in this relatively short sutta um, covers all of the uh, major themes of the Dhamma. That it begins with addressing the hindrances, uh, the five clinging aggregates are immediately mentioned, the scope of the Four Noble Truths, the importance of maintaining that focus is really the key theme of this, uh, and dependent origination. It's just a remarkable sutta, and it, it is the Buddha teaching a, um, a committed um, member of the original Sangha, but who is becoming confused, and ultimately his confusion is rooted in the immediate lack of concentration, but a, a concentration that will develop with continued Dhamma practice. And this touches a little bit on the conversation I had with Josh a bit earlier before we started class. The Tissa Sutta. The Buddha was at Savati, at Jita's Grove, Anatha Pandika's monastery. Tissa, a monk in the, in the Sangha, was distressed. He told a group of Sangha members, friends, I feel lost and uninspired. My mind is cloudy and overwhelmed. I am lethargic. Has any of you ever felt that way in your Dhamma practice? I find this life unsatisfying. Unsatis unsatisfying is an expression of dukkha, isn't it? I am uncertain about the Dhamma. Each and every one of us has felt this way, uncertain about the Dhamma. I certainly have. The Buddha heard of Tissa's comments from the Sangha members and summoned him for a talk. Uh-oh. Tissa went to the Buddha. He bowed in respect and sat to one side. Tissa, is it true that you feel lost and uninspired? Is your mind cloudy and overwhelmed? Are you lethargic? Do you find this life unsatisfying? Are you uncertain about my Dhamma? Tissa responds, yes, great teacher. Tissa, do you understand that one who is passionate, driven by desire, craving for and clinging to form and sensory satisfaction, they will experience sorrow, regret, pain, distress, and despair due to the change, to the change from and loss of sensory satisfaction. He's just describing his own explanation of dukkha. Excuse me for a moment. Tissa responds, yes, I understand, great teacher. Good. Tissa is, this is what follows for one craving for form. Craving for form means, in a, in a very broad sense, craving for form means craving to maintain the ignorant views that are manifesting within this form right now. So craving for the continued establishment of that is continued craving for form. And then form is um, the, the, uh, the broad concept of all five clinging aggregates. And, you, and also the, the mention here of sensory stimulation relates to the first hindrance that's often mentioned as a need for constant sensory stimulation. And so do you see the connection between the fabricated self, known as five clinging aggregates, and the motivating force for maintaining that, which is the constant need for sensory stimulation. Meaning in this moment, I need to evaluate what's occurring from the frame of reference, does this bring me pleasure or safety? Does it continue my, my fabricated views? Does it continue my agenda in this moment? Or is it threatening to me and my views of myself in relation to the world? That's the constant need for sensory stimulation that's manifested as five clinging aggregates and in this sutta as form. The Buddha said, good. This is what follows for one craving for form and for sensory satisfaction. Tissa. Do you understand that one is, who is free from passion and released from craving for form and sensory satisfaction does not experience sorrow, regret, pain, distress, and despair due to the change to the form and the loss of sensory satisfaction? I'm going to read it again because it, 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 it encompasses the whole Dhamma. Do you understand that one who is free from passion and released from craving? Free of passion and release from craving. Now remember, the underlying theme of the Dhamma is recognizing and abandoning ignorance of Four Noble Truths. And that's the focus. 
Do you understand that one who is free from passion and released from craving, free from passion for maintaining ignorance and free of craving towards continuing and, and finding ever more justification for our own ignorance? That's what craving is. It's not, it's not even craving for the, for the second, third, or for the whole chocolate cake. It's craving, immediate craving in this moment to maintain a fabricated view of self. That's often manifest in meditation as boredom. The thing that kicks us off our cushions most effectively is the immediate need to not be bored right now. What is that classified as a hindrance? As a need for sensory stimulation. That's what boredom is. So if I'm sitting in meditation or if I'm off my cushion and sitting in front of the television and law and order isn't distracting me enough anymore, I now know it's, I don't need to change the channel to find something to distract me. I need to take a breath and deepen my understanding of the Dhamma. It's, it is the key to the Dhamma, what the Buddha just taught us here from 2,600 years ago. So I read it maybe 100 times now. I'm going to read it once more. I'm going to change the name Tissa to us. Friends, do you understand that one who is free from passion and released from craving, craving for form and sensory satisfaction, that's the key to the Dhamma. And that manifests, that craving for form manifests in infinite ways, but also very common ways. And that craving for form usually then takes on some type of non-physical speculative form. And I'm not going to get deep into that because we've had many sutras on that. But when we crave for any other establishment other than what I can be, as taught in the Dattu Vibhanga Sutta, the Sutta on the, the, uh, the, the six properties of a human being, when I want to be anything more than that in this moment, whether it's from fear, desire, or anything else, any other fabricated emotion, I've lost my mind. But I know how to immediately get it back. Take a breath. And, and reframe my view from the point of view of right view, which is what the Buddha is teaching Tissa and teaching all of us. Uh, I won't read that again. Does not experience sorrow, regret, pain, distress, and despair due to the change in form and loss of sensory satisfaction. One point about that last mention to the change in form. The Buddha is not just talking about the physical change in form that happens each and every moment of a human life. We know from medical science, Josh and Kevin would, uh, uh, would affirm this, each and every moment the human body changes. Each and every moment thousands and thousands, millions of cells come into existence to maintain life, and millions and millions of cells slough off and slough out of existence for the same reason, to maintain life. It's, it, both of those actions are necessary to maintain a human life, but it's also reflective of the way that we think. So physical form changes moment by moment, no matter what we do. We can't stop that process or we'll die. We'll, 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 we'll cease to uh, have even an opportunity to awaken. But more importantly, as we deepen our concentration and understand, it's the form that our thoughts take that we have to understand the impermanent nature of that. Because it's insisting that, that our thoughts related to our form don't change, that is how we maintain ignorance. This is who I am and this is who I'm going to be. This is what I've decided I need to be happy in this life and these are the things I decided that I need to avoid. Which, and all of those things are reflected in what the Buddha describes as stress and suffering or five clinging aggregates. <laughs> The Buddha just asked Tissa that question. Tissa responds, yes, I understand, great teacher. The Buddha responds, good. This is what follows for one who has released, released from craving, <laughs> released from craving for or clinging to form and sensory satisfaction. Tissa, do you understand that one who is released from craving for and clinging to, <clears throat> uh, I'm sorry, Clinging to feelings or perceptions or fabrications or consciousness does not experience sorrow, regret, pain, distress, and despair due to the change of any of these aggregates. A direct reference to the five clinging aggregates. The description of the ongoing personal experience of suffering, rooted in ignorance of five no four noble truths. Tissa responds, yes, I understand, great teacher. Good. 
This is what follows for one release from craving for or clinging to any of these aggregates. Again, a direct teaching on the culmination of the path. Release from clinging to any one of those aggregates. And notice the, the um, subtle but profound teaching on the simplicity, the utter simplicity of the Dhamma. The Dhamma is resolved by letting go of clinging to any one of these aggregates, not even all five of them. That's how simple this is. And I know um, in, in application, the Dhamma doesn't seem that simple, but it's only because of the, our minds wanting to and insisting on maintaining ignorance that it seems complicated, but what could be more direct than what the Buddha just taught us here? This is what follows. The Buddha is talking about the culmination of the path of gaining true, uh, true awakening, true human maturity, full human maturity. This is what follows from one release from craving for or clinging to any of these aggregates. So as soon as I let go in this moment, Immediately. This is something I can plan to do, although I can lay the foundation through Dhamma practice. I can't decide that on June 14th at 11 a.m. I'm going to let go of clinging to form. It's this process that is established in true refuge and that each and every moment I make that decision that in this moment I am no longer clinging to any of the aggregates. And those manifest, how do we know which one is manifesting? Through the framework of the Eightfold Path. It becomes obvious that I'm either clinging to form in a general way, or it's a perception that's arising that's causing a distress, or a, a, a simple feeling that I'm rejecting for one reason or another, or the thoughts that start feeding additional fabricated views. And all of that is occurring immediately in this moment. What the Buddha is referring to here is what we talk about all the time, the immediacy of the Dhamma, the potential that each moment has to let go of all fabricated views, which is made by a decision, by the way, to let go of all fabricated views and maintain a mindful presence of life as life occurs. Notice how the Buddha is teaching Tissa in, 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 in every admonition to bring your mind back into the present moment. Bring your focus back on what's occurring right here and right now. Get your mind off of what you think you should be, where you think you might go, even what you might think of your, your, your perceptions of what Dhamma practice is, is rooted in a wrong view. The only way we can understand that is to understand what's occurring in this moment framed by the Eightfold Path. This is, do you understand that form is impermanent? and subject to change. Do you understand that feelings, perceptions, fabrications, and consciousness, that all of these five aggregates are impermanent and so subject to change? So anytime I'm clinging to any one of those forms, I'm insisting that that aspect of the form or the form itself do, does not change. That nothing takes away what I think I need to be happy and safe and, and that an even more pernicious idea that my human life will continue to provide for me the things that I decide I must have to be happy. And those things that I decide I must have to be happy are all impermanent or all rooted in impermanence. Yes, I understand, great teacher. Tissa, do you understand that what is impermanent, always subject to change, is stressful? Again, it, it's it's a very, very broad and all-encompassing teaching that the Buddha just said. But he's focusing it directly on what Tissa is holding in mind in this moment. And no matter what it is, it's impermanent. Why hang on to anything that is impermanent? It's, whatever it is, whatever object, event, view, or idea I'm focused on in this moment is impermanent. And no matter what I do, whether I decide I must not have it in my life, or I insist that I must have it, has no effect on the impermanence of what I'm focused on, does it? I have no control over the impermanence of objects, events, views, and ideas. In fact, you could say that the only effect that I could have on impermanence, but it's not a permanent impact, is deepening my concentration, because that's a direct counter to reacting to things changing. I'm able to, in fact, that's the definition of concentration. I don't lose my concentration when change occurs, when impermanence attacks the things that I'm holding on to. 
or the views that I'm holding on to. The only way that I cannot react is to develop concentration. Again, just to reiterate the point, that's the reason why the Buddha taught jhana meditation and nothing else, because nothing else will lead to that level of concentration. Tissa responds, yes, I understand that, great teacher. Well, Tissa, is it wise to cling to what is impermanent and stressful through self-identification as this is me, this is mine, this is what I am? Remember the Bahia Sutta and many others? No, it is not wise to cling to, <clears throat> to, cling to <laughs> sorry, to cling through self-identification to what is impermanent and stressful. Then Tissa, I teach that any form, any feeling, any perception, any fabrication, or any type of consciousness rooted in ignorance of Four Noble Truths should be known through wisdom and right view as, this is not me, this is not mine, this is not what I am. This, again, another line in this sutta that points to the entire sutta. Each and every moment we're recognizing that no matter what occurs, there's no self in it. This is not me. This is not mine. This is not what I am. Again, remember the, that, the, the Bahia Sutta and what he taught Bahia just prior to his awakening. Bahia awakened because he understood that nothing is personal in this world. And it cannot be personal. How can it be personal when it's impermanent? Remember the Anatta Lakana Sutta. Do you see how these, are, these suttas are all tied together and sometimes very subtle, but sometimes very direct ways, like in this sutta. Tissa, train yourself. Train yourself in this manner. Any form or feeling or perception or fabrication or consciousness whatsoever. Now the Buddha is referring to speculative self-establishment. Whatsoever that is past, present, or future. Whether seen as internal or external. Whether obvious or subtle. Whether unique or pervasive. Whether far or near should to right view be known as this is not me, this is not mine, this is not what I am. The Buddha is talking about any imaginary self-establishment. And it includes the, the immediate um, uh, imagined view that I need to be something. Maybe, maybe it's the world's greatest meditation teacher or the world's greatest roofer or the, the, world, the world's greatest politician. Whatever it is that I decide I am, I also concomitantly decide I need to be the greatest at that. Or the, 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 um, the view rooted in self-hatred that I can't possibly be as good as I think I need to be in the world, which leads to that grasping after salvation and speculative self-establishment that Buddha is talking about here. So anytime we try to establish ourselves in our imagination, it's a counter to that self-loathing that we feel because we don't understand. But it's not just that I might be the world's greatest meditation teacher in some future moment if I, if I do everything right. It's doing anything in this in, in immediately to change who I might be in the next moment. And so that can be any type of speculative existence. And I've mentioned uh, modern religions are the common repository. And I'm not beating up religion, but that's the common repository for speculative self-establishment. And again, that's, that's the pervasive example, but we do it in very, very subtle ways, and we do it constantly, establishing ourselves. And so when the Buddha talks about, and I talk about living the living death, not, it's not living, it's experiencing the living death of ignorance, that's what the Buddha is referring to. Because when we're living in our imagination, we cannot possibly be living in our lives, can we? In this moment, and for all intents and purposes, forever, I've located myself outside of my body, excuse me, in an imagined view, in a fabricated view of who I am and who I, who, and who I, I could even possibly be. But that imagination is manifesting in this form that also is established as five, a five property, a six property itself. And so we're always in conflict between what we want to be and what, what we naturally are. And once we finally accept who and what we are and all that we are, we cannot have a calm and peaceful mind simply because it's continued in ignorance. Is everybody clear on that? It's, it's, a, it's, a, it's such a subtle but single point. 
that what's occurring in this mo in this moment if in this moment i'm seeing and understanding myself clearly then there's no stress arising if in this moment i don't understand and i'm not seeing myself clearly there'll always be stress and it comes out of that single point of ignorance not understanding who i am in relation to the world what am i talking about right now the three marks of existence it all resolves in that understanding okay. buddha continues understanding this tissa <clears throat> The well-instructed Dhamma practitioner becomes disenchanted with form, disenchanted with feelings, disenchanted with perceptions, disenchanted with fabrications, and disenchanted with consciousness, meaning disenchanted with the ongoing thinking rooted in ignorance of four noble truths. We become disenchanted with something because we stop placing value on it. It's the only way to, to develop disenchantment with anything. In order to stop placing value on something that we once valued, we have to understand the valuelessness of that. We have to see it clearly or we won't let go of clinging. That's why clear view, right view is key to the Buddha's Dharma. And it's not just wishing or believing or hoping that the Buddha will, will bestow awakening on me because I believe in him or her or whatever it might be. Again, key to the Dharma. I have to understand who I am. Nobody and no thing and no agency can bestow understanding on another human being. The Buddha couldn't do it, and he understood that. If he if he could have done it, he likely would have established himself as a savior and snapped his fingers or rubbed Aladdin's lamp, and we'd all be awakened and we wouldn't be doing anything here right now. We'd simply be living in the bliss of understanding. But that's not true. Human beings have to decide who and what they're going to be. And we can decide if we're going to be awakened, fully mature human beings, or we can decide in this moment, now that those of us in this room know better, we can decide to continue ignorance. And if we decide in this moment to continue ignorance, nobody can say a word about it. It's up to us if we want to do it. It's not right and it's not wrong, except in the collective sense that ignorance leads to all the trouble we see in the world today. But that's, that's not an aspect of blame. It's an aspect of understanding. And if we use it as blame, we end up in the conditions that we are today in the world. And we won't get into that. Understanding does not lead, again, I'm not making a political statement. It, it's a statement of what we need in the world today. Understanding does not lead to rioting. Understanding leads to peace and calm. What's lacking in the world is not more legislation, although we might need some to get to the next moment in our human life what's needed is understanding for noble truths that's the only thing that's going to end stress and suffering in the world and it has to occur within each and every individual what can i do about it what is the most important thing i can do as a concerned modern buddhist as a concerned engaged buddhist if i'm really a concerned engaged buddhist i'll engage wholeheartedly with the dhamma and awaken before i engage in any other activity or I might decide that it's okay for me to burn down your store to make my point. But if my mind is well concentrated and I understand the nature of suffering, I could never ever have a thought that harming another human being could be good for me. It's simply not a possible thought. And again, I'm not, I'm not making a moral judgment on people that are doing that. They're doing it out of ignorance and a lack of understanding that is no longer supported in this world. What are we going to do about it? What can I do about it when I, when I feel myself starting to lose my mind over watching what's occurring in the world today? I can scream and holler and try to blame who's wrong, or I can understand that the only thing that I can do is to end ignorance in my own mind. And in that way, I'm no longer contributing to the ignorance in the world. This is what the most peaceful human being realized during his time of incredible strife. There was nothing much different between the Buddha's time and our time. We were just full, as full of hate as we are as a society then as we are now. And his solution was it when he, it, there's so many sutras where the Buddha is, is teaching the, the governors of his time what to do. And not once did he say you need more laws. Every single time he said what you need as a leader. And he didn't say, the people that you're governing need this. He says, what you need as a leader, if you're going to be a, a true leader, you need to understand the Dhamma. 
And and some people like King Ashoka, who was the most bloodthirsty human being the world has ever seen, took to the Dhamma and awakened and never harmed another human being. It's just, it, 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 and I'm making that point, I'm using that story to make the point. Again and again and again, if we really want to end the stress and suffering in the world, we'll end it in ourselves by ending ignorance. The Buddha continues. From disenchantment, passions fade away. And again, just to make the point, just to use current events to make the point that nothing has changed, think about if passions had diminished, what would have happened in the last couple of weeks of our human history? Again, it's not a judgment on what's occurring. What's occurring right now is, is occurring because it has to occur. Or maybe I should say it's occurring because it's occurring. It, it, to think that something that what's occurring should be different than it is is ridiculous, isn't it? It can't be different than it is because it's what's occurring. The only thing my thinking could help change is what might happen in the next moment. And what happens in the next moment is determined by what I'm holding in mind, my level of mindfulness, not somebody else, not a senator, a president, a protester, or a rioter. It's what I'm holding in mind that's going to determine my experience of the next moment. This passion, the well-instructed Dharma practitioner is released from clinging to wrong views. This passion, through this passion, we gain the ability to release ourselves from clinging to wrong views. But as long as I'm passionate for those views, I, it's impossible to let go of them, aren't they? And as a human being who understands the Dhamma, I want to be free of all fabricated views. And I know how to do it. In fact, I even know how to recognize a fabricated view. Is my mind distressed in this moment? Because a, a view that is unfabricated, that is rooted in reality, cannot possibly lead to a distressed mind. Dhamma, it, it, that Dhamma, a well-instructed Dhamma practitioner is released from clinging to wrong views. With release, they know through direct experience, I am released. That's what I just said. How do I know I'm, I am released? When the people and events of the world no longer cause me to lose my mind whether it's in a very subtle way or a very obvious way, through extreme rage and anger. Through direct experience, I am released. It's not from listening to me. It's not from listening to these wonderful words of Siddhartha Gautama from 2,600 years ago. It's through my direct action, through my true refuge in the Buddha, the Dhamma, and this well-focused Sangha. By fully integrating these simple instructions, I am released. I am released through, they are released through their own right efforts. And they know, as Dhamma practitioners, we know that birth is ended. What's the Buddha referring to here? We know from our studies of karma and rebirth, he's not talking about that a physical birth has now ended. Notice the context of this suit and all the other ones that the Buddha is referring to birth. What are we, what are we talking about? Ignorance. So in this moment, the possibility of me giving birth to another moment rooted in ignorance is ended. Birth is ended. Life integrated with the Eightfold Path has been completed. That's often referred to in the translations as the holy life has been fulfilled. But that's not, the Buddha is not talking about religion and holy, even though it doesn't really refer to religion, often uh, we default that holy means religious. It simply means wholly integrated in a certain point of view. And in this case, the holy life means that we have fully integrated in right view and no other view. Birth has ended, life integrated with the Eightfold Path has been complete. There is no further clinging to the world or clinging to any of the five clinging aggregates. Friend, Tissa, think of it this way. <laughs> Imagine two men, one skilled in the Dhamma and one not. The man unskilled in the Dhamma asked the skilled man to describe the Eightfold Path. The skilled man would answer, the path is like this. You walk along and come to a fork in the road. You avoid the left fork and take the right. You walk further and come across a thick forest. Further still is a swamp. Even further, you come along a steep cliff. cliff. Continuing on, the path you Clinging on the path, you arise at a delightful place of spacious and level ground. 
think about that as a as the um, the metaphor for the view of burgeoning awakening. Spacious and level ground. Level is pointing to the uh, the a mind resting in equ equanimity too, isn't it? There's no bumps in the way. We're we're getting a look at as the Buddha described. Uh, in a Loka Sutta, looking back on the world, the world is a flame. We're getting a look at what it, at a, at a description of a mind that is not a flame. I tell you the story to teach you that the unskilled man is an ordinary person with no knowledge of my Dhamma. The skilled man is worthy and a rightly self-awakened man. The fork in the road represents uncertainty. So what the, remember the first fork in the road. What happens? Which fork am I going to take? Am I going to take the left fork or the right fork? The framework of the Eightfold Path takes that mind in the moment that is uncertain and might fall to the left fork and guides it through the Eightfold Path to the right fork. That's what the Buddha is talking about. The Eightfold Path is the path that leads us to awakening. It's the path that guides us to awakening. That's why it's called the path. And each and every factor of that path continues to reinforce the other seven factors of the path. The fork in the road represents uncertainty. The left fork is the wrong eightfold path. It's an interesting translation here that I spend a little time deciding should I leave that word in there, even though it was in most of the translations that I looked at. But the Buddha is using the eightfold path as the declarative path for his path to awakening, but we can we can develop any type of path, call it an eightfold path, but it's a wrong path. So even the label that we put on something has to be an accurate label, it has to accurately describe what we're talking about. Is that clear? We can't make up our own path. It has to be an authentic path. So a, a made up eightfold path would be the left fork. The left fork is the wrong eightfold path. This, pa this path continues wrong views, wrong intentions, wrong speech, wrong actions, wrong livelihood, wrong effort, wrong mindfulness, and wrong meditation. The Buddha is describing that every aspect of a, of a fabricated eightfold path, every aspect of it, is a wrong or debilitating aspect. There's no value in some, as far as a Dhamma practitioner, there's no value in adding, adapting, accommodating, or embellishing the Eightfold Path in any way. And it is through studying the Dhamma and understanding the suttas like this that I became clear on that, that I was able to get past the, the little, the subtle bit of, con, of conditioning that would say, well, isn't someone who is just wonderfully compassionate all the time a Dhamma practitioner? No, they're not. Because there's much more to just to, to react with compassion to the Dhamma. As Dhamma practitioners, we understand it. People that don't think that it's that we can be good people by just being good people. Most people can't because of a mind rooted in ignorance of four noble truths. And that doesn't mean that if we don't adopt the Eightfold Path, we're going to all end up as murderers or arsonists. But it does mean that we'll be holding ill, at the very least, we'll be holding ill will towards ourselves or others or both. And it is that, that subtle aspect of ill will that holds us out or prevents us from awakening. Going on. The right fork is a noble eightfold path. This path develops right view, right intention, right speech, right action, right livelihood, right effort, right mindfulness, and right meditation. The thick forest represents ignorance of the four noble truths. The thick forest. We can't see the forest from a tree. It's such an important statement. When we start substituting anything but pure Dhamma, we will no longer be able to see the forest for the trees. We'll no longer be able to see four noble truths. Again, that's what the Buddha is teaching here. It's a very simple and direct practice, but the practice itself has to be pure. The swamp represents sensual desires. The cliff represents anger, resentment, and despair. What a beautiful metaphor. Oh, maybe not beautiful in that sense. What a skillful metaphor. Metaphor. The delightful place of spacious and level ground represents the release from craving and clinging to wrong views, ignorance of four noble truths. Rejoice now, Tissa, rejoice. A rightly self-awakened one is here to inspire you, to guide you, to teach you. This is what the Buddha said. 
Tissa was gratified and deleted, delighted at these words. So, excuse me for a moment. It's, it's another one of those suttas, again, where you'll hear me say the whole sutta is described here, uh, and it is, of course. Uh, it's a sutta like this and many others that cause your teacher to say over and over again, probably to the, to the, uh, <laughs> the point of enough is enough, that the Dhamma is, is very simple, it's very direct in its practice right here and right now. It's practiced through a ever-deepening level of jhana, ever-deepening level of concentration, and an ever-deepening level of understanding and integrating, becoming holy with the Eightfold Path. So let's go around the room. I think I'll start with, with Josh this morning. Josh, how are you this morning? Good. Thank you, John, for the Suda. Hello, everybody. Good morning. Uh, I I enjoyed the teaching, and I'm just going to listen this morning. Thank you. Thank you for joining. Ram, good morning. Good morning. <clears throat> Yes, <clears throat> great teaching for a beautiful morning like this. Um, most of it is is a, 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 like a reprise of the uh, Natala Khanda Sutta. Yeah. Um, and um, then he follows it up with that beautiful metaphor of uh, of the path and. Um, the, the metaphor of, of developing the the eightfold path. Mm -hmm. yeah. um, where we finally end up in a place of uh, ease and calm, that, that spacious and level ground. Um, and it's of course nice that that you know Tisa being the, the cousin of, of the Buddha, that you know he gets this direct and um, you know, he's already, and it's it's like it's also a, um, a quick triple refuge. You know, he mm -hmm. has the, the refuge of the Buddha right in front of him. Um, <clears throat> the Sangha has has brought him there. You know, in in his confusion and. Um, The Dharma, you know, was just explained to him. That's it. Yeah. It's. Uh, yeah. It's you nice. Know, I'm sorry, go ahead. Remember it this way. You know, it, it's. Uh, um, and, you know, and and it's also because we've <clears throat> a lot of us have been in this place where Tisa is now. You know, yeah. we <clears throat> We work on the Dharma and, and we, we, you know, get knocked back every now and then of, of either not getting it or, or not wanting to get it. Uh, and um, <clears throat> he puts it right there and it's, um, it's a nice reminder for all mm -hmm. of us. We get back on the path and this is how we get to the end point. Of ease and calm. Thank you. Yes, yeah, thank you. I remember how this the suit started out with Tissa declaring how distressed he is and how uncertain he is about his <clears throat> dharma practice. And Ram, I mentioned it while in my commentary. And the Buddha points him back to the to the refuge of the dharma and and the actual study of the dharma. In that case, Ram Ram really uh, saw that that the Buddha was represented. He was sitting in front of Tissa. The Tissa was part of the Sangha, but what he was lacking was a little bit more understanding of the Dhamma, the third refuge. And so the Buddha just pointed him back to that. Really is remarkable. Um, Liz, how are you this morning? I'm doing fine. It's nice to see everyone. Good to see um, you. I'm going to take noble silence. I'm glad you're here. Good morning, Jen. Good morning, John. Good morning, everyone. Um, I think I just like this one excerpt uh, that is sort of summing it all up. 
any form or feeling or perception or fabrication or consciousness whatsoever, past, present, or future, whether seen as internal or external, or whether obvious or subtle, whether you're unique or pervasive, whether far or near, should through right view be known as this is not me, this is not mine, this is not who I am. That's just the, such a great moment to moment reminder of how you need to apply the Dhamma moment by moment by moment by moment. Excellent, Jen, and that takes concentration, doesn't it? <clears throat> sure does. Thank you. Good morning, Becky. Good morning. <clears throat> um, I'm happy to be here. Hi, everyone. Good nice to see you. Always nice to be with you all, even if it's just virtually. Yeah. Um, I just have a question about the metaphor. Um, when you, you're on the, you're, you chose the right fork and you come to a forest, a swamp, and a cliff, and then to a place of spacious flatness. The, when you come to the forest, is is he saying, is he saying you will, you will have points where you will be distracted from the past yes. mm -hmm. and then the point is to just keep, keep on the path as much as you can right. but, and recognize that these are distractions. Yes. And that if you can just keep up right effort, even though these distractions are pulling you, you <laughs> will eventually get there. I couldn't say another word. I probably will, but I couldn't say another word. <laughs> that is it. The Buddha is at, at referring to the right fork is referring to the beginning of the Eightfold Path, and then the forest, the swamp, and the cliff are the difficulties or the hindrances along the path. So we, again, he's, he's, he's encouraging us that just deciding on the Eightfold Path, just turning to the right is not enough. You have to actually continue it through the forest, through the swamp, through the cliff of our own thinking. And at some point, you're going to have to jump off the cliff. But we do it with, <laughs> in my own metaphor, we do it with a parachute of concentration. How's that? Mm, the power that of concentration. <laughs> it, Becky, you really hit it. It, it is it is right effort that keeps us going through the forest. This I, was just gonna say, I was just going to, to say that. Then, that. then the thing that you really have to do is maintain that right effort. Yep. That's it. <laughs> you can't get it, distracted from that or you're lost. Yeah, and, and that's why it's there. It, excuse me. Right effort, I mean, you could say this about all the eight factors of the Eightfold Path, but right effort is not something that a mind rooted in ignorance wants anything to do with. It doesn't want to engage in any effort that might challenge itself. That's why mm -hmm. continued effort seems very difficult at times, especially in the beginning, but it could be 10 years in the practice that something comes up that wants to knock us off our, away from our practice. And it's always rooted in those hindrances, isn't it? So it, at whatever point we start losing the Dhamma, like Tissa was, the answer is, come back to the Eightfold Path. And it, it's still a relevant teaching today, isn't it? Yes. Thank you for your insight this morning, Becky. Thank you. Hello, Michael. Hi, John. Hi, everybody. Hello. Good to see you. Uh, good to see you also. Um, there's, a, there's a lot in this, uh, this reading, and uh, I, I enjoyed it uh, thoroughly. Um, a couple of things. Uh, Direct experience, I am released. Uh, direct experience is living in the here and now, uh, refined mindfulness. Uh, in that state of being, uh, we were, um, 
we're aware, we understand what distractions are, distractions, obviously fabrications and, um, um, and, the, and the aggregates. Uh, and until we recognize and get a grasp on that, we'll suffer. So uh, again, and we do that again, in my estimation here, or my uh, opinion here is that that happens like uh, being present, you know, moment by moment. And uh, that, that is where the work, the work comes in with the Dhamma, um, but it's, uh, it's well worth the effort. So basically that's all I'm gonna say on that. Uh, but a, a great, uh, actually, I, I enjoyed your, I, I will say this one more thing. Uh, um, and when you were talking about, like, just uh, briefly, when you uh, touched on the social unrest uh, that's occurring and, uh, and the, um, I, I like the way you, you, uh, you weaves, the, you know, uh, weaves in the, um, Three, the three marks of uh, three marks of existence and understanding uh, the nature of ignorance as and, and where we are in this world and uh, and and our own ignorance and the ignorance of others and to recognize that we we uh, can't get past you know we, we have to understand that that we are working for the cessation of stress and suffering ourselves and um, uh, understanding the aggregates and impermanence in, in relation uh, to our own uh, our, our own being uh, existence, then we can recognize it in the, the nature of other you know the nature of other individuals that are yeah. that aren't uh, they're they're not on a path that uh, leads to the cessation of of ignorance. So um, uh, that's where again like uh, that's where right compassion mm -hmm. I would say comes in. Mm -hmm right view of things comes in um, and that's that's just basically all I have to say with that just and thank you thank you uh, for I, I really thought the uh, uh, you uh, imparted like a uh, great understanding and I, I was uh, it was a good a good explanation a good class and, and I'm glad to be here and part of it thank you uh, thank you Michael um, two things one is I'm going to ask you a question that I really want to encourage you not to answer if you feel it's too personal. Um, but the other is just before I forget, um, the Saturday that we're back in Frenchtown, June the 20th, I'm going to change the schedule a little bit and we're going to teach the Salata Sutta, the Sutta on the Two Arrows, because that so perfectly describes what's occurring in the world and what we as authentic Dhamma practitioners can do about it. Um, and also, you made an important point there somewhat subtle, it might be missed, that as Dhamma practitioners who understand the manifestations and the motivation for the manifestations of ignorance in the world, don't then decide, well, that person is ignorant, and we fall into the same trap that they tend to, that if you don't agree with them, you're evil, or you're bad, or you're wrong. That is how we generate authentic compassion, isn't it? We understand ignorance arising in other people. And that is, I mean, I, I'm sure it's going to be another one of my controversial statements. But when I saw that, um, that human being kneeling on the neck of another human being with the intention of killing him, I felt great sadness for both of them. You could say maybe my immediate sadness was for the, the man that got murdered. But imagine living a life with a mind like that other. And, and notice I'm not putting a race on this because I don't think it is. But that's another thing. Imagine having to live a life with a mind that that officer had, they all say that, and not knowing how to get out of it. Imagine that. That To me, that's the essence of suffering. Forget the, the horrible results of that type of thinking. But that d deserves at least as much compassion as the, the poor man that lost his life because of that ignorance. Again, I, I, I didn't want to get excited about this, but you started it, Michael. As Dhamma practitioners, we understand it. We understand why these things manifest. And they're trying to blame an individual for the, for the societal manifestations of ignorance is never going to get to that point. It doesn't mean that we shouldn't do that. It doesn't mean that there shouldn't be societal consequences for people that act in this way. And I, I'm certainly not saying that. But we still need to understand it. We still need to understand it if we're going to end it, you know, and again, the Buddha didn't teach salvation and I'm not teaching it either. I'm not teaching that we should get to the point 
where these things no longer happen in the world. I don't think we will. The Buddha tells us we won't. It's inherent mm -hmm. in, the, in the world that is rooted in ignorance that these things occur. And of course it occurs through people. How else could these horrible things manifest? How else could ignorance manifest in the world? Ignorance isn't going to manifest in the world in an oak tree, is it? An oak tree doesn't have any impact on the world. Ignorance is, isn't going to impact on the world through a dog or a Maserati or a paintbrush. Ignorance is going to manifest in the world through thinking, through what we're holding in mind. And so the solution is to change what we hold in mind. Sorry, Michael, you, uh, you got me going again. But that's the point of the Dhamma. Again, I'm not talking about the world right now. I'm talking about the Dhamma. The Dhamma changes our mind if we want it. It's like I said this a few times. My, my, my friend, uh, Brother Ken, the, the Jesuit monk uh, who, who had nine nervous breakdowns, and he always said, what's wrong with losing your mind? You just get another one. That's what the Buddha is teaching us. Let go of that, that rotten mind we've had that has led us astray all this time and develop this pure and calm mind resting in understanding of what it means to be a human being in a world like this, not in a, in a, in a world of peace and calm, because that's not the world we live in. And to imagine that, to make believe by insisting that we should live in a world like that is the ultimate fabrication, isn't it? And that gets us to grasp after other fabricated ideas to, to resolve an issue that is rooted in ignorance and can only be addressed through ignorance. But, uh, thank you, Michael. Thank you. <laughs> Juliet, uh, thank you. Did I mention? Yeah, June 20th. Um, Julia, thank you for that, the, the uh, Sika Sutta flowchart. I'm going to put it on the website, but it's really just excellent. I, and you'll, oh, I'll, I'll, you, John. I'll announce it in the newsletter, too, so you know what I'm thinking, talking about now. But, Thank good morning, you, Julia. Good morning. Um, I don't have very much to say either. This is a, this was a very I lo I love this sutta. It was very 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 good, and I lo and I love the way you explained everything, John, and referred it back to the the world that we live in today. Uh, <laughs> um, I agree with Becky. I, this metaphor um, I really enjoyed the the whole metaphor, and it's funny because I I started drawing a picture because at first I thought, hey. He's been, he's making us right on walk on the on um, the, the eightfold path. <laughs> See, I, I drew the whole picture, <laughs> and I'm like, he's making us walk on the path, but but we're walking through the forest of ignorance, the swamp of sensuality, and the cliffs of anger and despair, filing to get to awakening. And at first, I thought, well, I have this wrong, so I I drew it out, and I'm like, no, this is this is because this is life. Yeah, this is you know, life. Yeah. We're not just going to walk through, not, through a nothing. We're going to walk through all this. You know, we we have to have understanding. Walking through the forest of ignorance, we have to understand impermanence and the, the swamp of sensuality. We're going to be bombarded with all the things in life, but we have to walk dispassionately past that forest. And um, and so I realized. I said, ah, it's 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 you know right, just like as Beth, Becky said, right effort and right right view that we finally come to the awakening, you know, I finally make it to the end. But I like the way the Buddha had put out the, um, this path, at, you know, and I, it, it's, it's, it, it's life. It's exactly the way it is. Yeah. Know? Yeah. It's a perfect sutra. It's, it's, I like the, I like all the metaphors. I yeah. Thank you, John. I, thank you, Julia. It, it, uh, it, yeah, the, the Buddha is just describing what it means to be a human being it is understanding that life and understanding the things that are occurring in our life and not taking any of it personally, but not taking something personally doesn't mean that we don't contribute to the, the, the betterment of the world. In fact, we know that the, the way that we can do that, the way we can improve society is by not taking things personally and understanding what's occurring and maintaining a calm and peaceful mind. You mentioned impermanence, Julia, and I did, it just popped into my head. We had a, uh, going back a few years, we used to have these things called the Donna dinner, which was right a Tuesday before Thanksgiving. And the one that we had right after the last presidential election, many people had lost their minds over that election. And I remember saying to probably a dozen people that night to understand impermanence that we get, we, you know, as a, as a voting block or voting country, we get to vote again in four years. 
that's 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 our own input into impermanence and it's it the, and to me the greatest protest i have is my vote and i exercise it whenever it's appropriate which is usually most elections i uh, and and knowing that brings a peace and calm right now because i know i know the, the most effective thing i can do i likely will do and i also i personally take some comfort in the way that my thinking has changed through the dhamma that i believe that when i pull the lever i'll be making a much more mindful choice I'll, i might not be completely happy with who i would be voting for but i've never been completely happy with voting for anyone my entire life we, we you know again using the mindfulness i develop i can think a little better than i used to i might just i might stop choosing people based on the ideologies i had as a youth and make it a more realistic choice but that's impermanence isn't it my choice might be even if the same person was running my choice might be different this time because my thinking is different it's impermanence yeah. thank you julia uh lorna how are you Hi, I'm good. Thank you, John. How are you? I'm good. Thank you for asking. Good. Um, I think I've had a bit of a wake-up call this morning, actually, listening to, uh, listening to your talk this morning. Um, as regards the five clinging aggregates, um, I think in the past I've always thought of form, feeling, perceptions, mental fabrications, knew what it was. Um, I don't think I've ever seen the understanding of consciousness quite as clearly as I have this morning. Oh. I'm beginning to think that, the, if I'm right, the, the understanding of consciousness is, <clears throat> I know we don't use the word soul, um, so, but that kind of like fits the description of consciousness. So, whether your other four clinging aggregates are in your mind, you might be able to see them <clears throat> and follow them in your mind and therefore dismiss them, come back to your breath, something like that. But the consciousness is really, really not not a thought, but who you who you think you are, but not in a thought way. Yep. In it's more in a, I, uh, just use that word again in in your soul who you think you are, but we don't use the word the soul because it's impermanent. So, or oh, that con that is in, it's just a thought anyway, but. Um, so I, I've, I've, I've seen this morning that um, form, feeling, perception, man, mental fabrications, if there was four clinging aggregates, it would be a lot easier. <laughs> <laughs> it's that blooming consciousness that, we, that we've come to think of who we are. It's that is consciousness. Yeah. <laughs> Whether we're thinking it at that moment is 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 not is not uh, is not relevant because no. we carry it with us all the time, mm -hmm. even though we're not. It's not in our heads. It's just who who we think we are. I know that all this is just same words that we've all said before, but I've, I've kind of like had that little window of opening in my mind this morning, and. Knowing that consciousness and seeing that consciousness a little bit more clearly, you can see it's like that's the mirror image that we create for ourselves yeah. in the world. Um, I, I don't know if this is making clear. Well, I'm not actually saying what I think I'm you know, I'm trying to describe something that I can't really, I don't find easy to describe. But as I say, I, I think, I think this morning I've, I've had that window opening yeah. of that word, what the Buddha means by consciousness. Yeah. And it's not a thought. It's, it's a belief in who you are, but it's not necessarily in your mind at the time. 
uh, as I say, form, feelings, perception, mental fabrications, you can latch on to, you can jiggle in your mind and thinking, mm -hmm. right, I'm, I'm, you know, I'm thinking about form or I'm, mm -hmm. I'm wanting a new car or whatever it is. You can follow those thoughts, but that consciousness that we, we all walk about with 24-7 is what the con is the consciousness that the Buddha's thinking about, uh, referring to. Yeah. <laughs> um, that's it. Thank you. Uh, Laura, that was just, just brilliant. I understand. I think everybody here understood exactly what you were saying. And again, it's the, it's the essence of the Dhamma is understanding. You mentioned the word soul. Um, it's easy to fall into that or, or use that as a reference. Um, but all that, all that, the five clinging aggregates are are realized in the fifth aggregate of consciousness that is housed in the first aggregate the form so what i'm saying is that our consciousness then and as you describe it as soul is simply a fabricated object that we think is us and the object is encompassing all of our fabricated thinking so a mind and getting into a, a mind that thinks of itself in that objectified way has to create constant repositories such as the idea that this this conscious construct of self is actually the soul we have to give it some kind of supernatural relevance to establish the the permanence in, in a single thought and now this constructed thought this fabricated or i should say a fabricated thought construct really our imagination becomes something that we call a soul when it's all just made up in our head and you described it brilliantly i mean that's that's what we do and we carry this soul around with us our entire life and so we're living a life as a soul <laughs> rather than a human being we're not souls are we we're not imaginations we're not manifestations or individual imagine individual imagination this is reality we're living a human life. But we, when we're not living a human life, we have to create all these establishments, such as the idea of a soul or anything else, to make this wrong view real. Or we can, we can let go of that form, feeling, perceptions, fabrications, and the consciousness that supports the form by realizing right view. I think you explained it uh, much more clearly than I just did. So <laughs> thank you, Lorna. John, can I say a little yeah. something? It, it, the tricky part here is that we use that fifth aggregate to deal with the other four aggregates. Yeah. Or you, I would say maintain the other four. Or maintain the other four. Yeah. Yeah. And so that, again, the Buddha's Dhamma is focused directly on, well, you can't say directly, but it is, it is meant to address the way that we think, but within the form. I mean, that, that's an important but subtle point. We're not trying to change something that's external. My, the five clinging aggregates prevail past awakening. They're still part of a human being's life, but we no longer create an identity by clinging to a feeling that's arising or a perception. And I no longer create fabrications rooted in ignorance. But there's still a consciousness that now is rooted in wisdom and is manifesting through that form as an awakened human being. So the, the form is the same, isn't it? But it's the manifesting thought behind it that changes everything. Thank you, Ron. Good morning, Tim. Where'd you go? There you are. Good morning. Good morning. Um, I'm, I'm well. I hope everybody's doing well, too. Yep. Um, you know, the, the power of this sutta is that it's a, an example of a Dhamma in action. Yeah. All these suttas where there's interaction between the Buddha are, you know, and the Buddha's ability to say things concisely are incredibly uh, powerful. Um, and from what everybody's saying today, uh, yeah, just very, very powerful, powerful things. Um, to your point and to a, a couple of people's points in regards to, to what's going on uh, yesterday, a week ago, and to what's going to happen tomorrow, and that is emotional responses to impermanent phenomena results in dukkha. Yep. Period. And 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 you know that that goes back to what we I, I think talked about yesterday or, or Tuesday uh, that you know the truth 
of dukkha is to be understood. We need to all understand that. And again, the cause of dukkha needs to be abandoned. And Buddha just goes through those steps of the Four Noble Truths one by one. And I really uh, thought that him, that the Buddha uh, really emphasized in Chutissa the disenchantment and dispassionate not to react to those impermanent things will aid him in, in keeping that calm and peaceful mind yep. in the moment. Um, and then, you know, the application of compassion and empathy, um, which kind of are both, we've talked about that as well, uh, to assist us in, in right view to develop that eightfold path. And I think what's going on today, it's really um, something that all of us here being coming to class uh, every week can see the, the world being aflame in front of us and can see the suffering and, and its, cause, its root causes through the Dhamma. Um, the one thing I, I, I found interesting though about the suit is that um, the Buddha never really discussed with Tissa the quality of mind the foundations of mindfulness. And I was wondering if there was a reason for that. Um, I read yeah. this four times and there wasn't any direct, I know there's some subtle indirect um, cases that you could argue that, but it doesn't directly say to Tissa, what is the quality of your mind right now? It's a great question, Tim. And, and it's, it, remember that we have established here in 2020, a Sangha that is very, very similar to the original Sangha. So Tissa has heard probably over and over again, the, like we have, the four foundations of mindfulness. So it's not something that needs to be talked about or referenced in every sutta to give it validity. It's, it's simply part of Dhamma practice. And again, notice how the sutta begins with all, establishing Tissa as a Dhamma practitioner. We know that he is because the sutta describes that. Uh, so he's the Buddha is focusing on something very specific here, um, but of course, as Dhamma practitioners, we know the four foundations of mindfulness. We know he doesn't get, get into a complete description of four noble truths, but he references it. He doesn't get into a complete description of the manifestations of the hindrances, but they're certainly referenced here. So Tim's bringing up an important point, but it's what we experience here. We don't just study one or two concepts and call it Buddhist practice. We study everything the Buddha taught and call that Buddhist practice. So he didn't just teach one sutta or just one idea. He taught, in effect, eight ideas, known as an eightfold path, that have a lot of other supportive suttas. But each and every one of those suttas is very specific to manifestations of ignorance. The reason why the Buddha teaches something is because he notices ignorance arising and he teaches a counter to that, the, 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 the Dhamma-centered counter. To ignorance and it's, every suit is like that. So. Thank you, Tim. Uh, one more yes. thing, uh, if I could just respond to that, please. Um, I, yes, and, and that's I'm glad you said that because that's how I felt reading this. That that there are things that at, at Tissus level and at our level that we we know from reading suttas and having classes. And maybe not necessarily somebody that just comes into a class first time, but certainly everybody here. You know, we we know he, you know, the Buddha says in quotes, Tissa, do you understand that what is impermanent, always subject to change, is stressful? That is the number one tenet of the Dhamma. That's the first noble truth. Yep. So that's what I, that's all I'm saying. It's like, but the mindfulness thing, yes, I agree that you know, certainly when I see something on the news and I feel that oh, I go back to the breath and I say, well, what is my quality of mind? And yes, but the first thing I, I try to really know is what Buddha says is that this is all impermanent and to react to it is going to create dukkha. It's gonna, it's gonna, it's gonna be there. Yep. Um, but, but again, I just, I just, um, you know, to take this just an amazing um, experience that must have been <laughs> to be in front of the Buddha and have have this lesson. 
um, and, I, and how we can experience it right now because it really does, it really does, like Lorna says, open up those windows. Yeah. For all of us to, to kind of let that fresh air in. <laughs> so, <laughs> yeah. Thank you, thank you Terry. It, it is, it's a remarkable suit. If you think about, put yourself in Tissa's position, he understands the Buddhist teaching. He's just, he's just confused in his mind right now. Um, and so the Buddha teaches that all things are impermanent. Tissa's taking that in because he's under, he, he's learned the four foundations of mindfulness. And so internally he's referencing the, 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 the thoughts and the feelings that are impermanent and the, and the, the fourth foundation, the present quality of mind that is all impermanent. So he understands that and the Buddha is taking that understanding and putting this, um, very gentle uh, focus on this is what you need to be focused on. He's drilling Tissa's broad Dhamma practice down, and he knows from Tissa's question where, it, where the focus needs to be on a very specific aspect. The, the, and he's really, he's really assigning Tissa's thinking to the three marks of existence. He's, he's assigning Tissa's understanding and focus on be mindful of the hindrances, don't let them stop you. When they arise, take a breath, <laughs> unite your mind and your body, and come back to the four foundations of mindfulness, which is jhana practice. Mm -hmm. What a great point, Tim. Thank you. Uh, we moved around a little bit. I don't want to lose anybody. But Laura, how are you? Hello. Hi, how are you, Laura? Hi. Good to see you. Um, yeah, I'm just humbled. Uh, this morning, um, I you know, the depth of understanding that everyone has, and the sutta really encompasses yeah. so many different aspects of um, what you uncover when you have the right effort, like Becky said, on the path. And, and um, one of the first things that came to my mind as I was listening to you speak, John, was thinking about those arrows and you know, how we can stop that uh, from occurring when we, you know, say, this is not me, this is not mine, this is not who I am. Um, so the, you know, the five clean aggregates are really just this point of reference, you know, for where I, I find they, they inform you where you are. Um, <laughs> And are when they're not clinging, you know, yeah. you have that spaciousness, you know, um, to have the understanding. Um, yeah, so lots to think about. <laughs> lots to think about, and lots to just you know keep on in 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 every every turn. Just <laughs> remembering remembering your breath and your practice. Um, it's a challenging time. So. It sure is. And, and we're so fortunate to have the refuge of the Dhamma, don't we, in these times? Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. I found uh, I didn't want to stop meditating this morning when it was time to stop meditating. I'm like, well, that's, that's okay to be clinging to that. <laughs> yeah, yeah, that's all right. <laughs> I, would, I would encourage that type of clinging. <laughs> <laughs> okay, thank you, everyone. Thanks for joining us. Hi to all the Branhams. <laughs> Mary, how are you this morning? Good morning, everyone. Good morning. Um, this has been a great sutta and a great class. Um, I think, um, you know, it's been an interesting week in our lives, interesting months, different, interesting era of our time. And um, uh, the Eightfold Path has come into uh, great use this week, um, really even taking a look at right view and what right view means in uh, a world where um, some people are experiencing more social injustice than others. Um, lots of good conversation happening in our household with two young 20-somethings. And mm. they have a very different perspective, but it's not a wrong perspective. So there was a lot of learning that occurred through um, listening and um, right speech and right intention and right effort. And um, 
you know, the Eightfold Path and, and like right mindfulness, you know, informed my concentration this week. Um, I lead a large group of people, so helping them uh, to navigate this space um, as sometimes people look to their, you know, leaders to do. Um, uh, and, and, you know, in, hopefully informed with wisdom to um, help, you know, each of us people, you know, as I get off my cushion, it's the interfacing with the phenomenal world and all the people in my life. And, um, and not, not being, oh, I just need to think about this, mm. but being part of the phenomenal world in a way informed by the Eightfold Path. Mm. And um, I, I did feel a little anxious before we got on the call, but I'm, you know, because of the wisdom of everybody and, and everybody's sharing this morning and this sutta, you know, I have, you know, the sense of, of spaciousness and equanimity. So mm -hmm. the, the power of the Sangha is a real thing, even on Zoom. <laughs> Um, and uh, I'm just so grateful. I'm so grateful. I don't know what I would have done except maybe lose my mind uh, this week, um, but I didn't. And, uh, you know, I had children in harm's way. I guess they're not children. I had young adults in harm's way this week because they were peacefully uh, protesting. I'm proud of them. Um, but I'm still a mother, so it, uh, it has been, um, you know, a very interesting week, but my, uh, the most significant uh, thing is that the Eightfold Path was with me all along, the tools in the toolbox, the coming back to my breath and um, staying in right view um, really aided uh, me and probably the people around me this week um, uh, so I'm just so grateful, and I think so many things that have been said this morning um, have, you know, made me go, ooh, you know, let me write that down. So lots of good stuff. So thank you so much to you, John, and the Sutta and the Sangha. Thank you. Thank you, Mary. Um, I would bet that your, um, the, the calm mindfulness that you've developed through the Dhamma, through your right efforts, um, is such a uh, is such a refuge to your daughters, both you and David, but also to um, that large organization that you're the that you're the head of, because you're you're expressing that common peace to them, and they're able to to stand on that and do their work, uh, and it's important. We're, and we all do that. I mean, I, I'm just using Mary as an example of how the the practical impact that individual Dhamma practice has on. Or you know, the, our local, at least our local community, uh, you know. And it's it, it, the, the ability to try and be authentic. You know, I, yeah. it's it's so easy not to be. We hear that. You know, we've heard that all over the place yeah. this week, where people are trying to say the right thing, but they haven't taken a moment of time to try and get into right view. Yeah. And, um, so we we trudge on in an effort to be ever more authentic uh, with our Dhamma and our speech. So thank you. Yeah. Thank you, Mary. I mean, I, I grew up, um, those that are around my age, I'm 64. Um, I grew up in a time that was exactly like this as far as protests. We were, there was protest almost every day against the Vietnam War and other social ills. You know, they were, they, they, they kind of attached um, uh, race to that issue too, because it was real back then. Um, but even but even the conditions of um, just to put the label on everybody's using to defund the police, that's nothing new either. Uh, that was that was the same thing that people were screaming in the streets back then. Um, I, one of the things that really opened my eyes to and had me thinking about my own participation in this, I was. Um, it was 1973 or so. I was 18, I guess. I used, I used to, this memory, I used to think I was much younger, but I think it was 1973. Um, 
And there was a, a march from Washington Square up Fifth Avenue, and I was a part of it. And uh, there were there were some army personnel that were actually part of the march in uniform. And we're walking up Fifth Avenue. God, man, it's all these years later. It still brings me to tears what I saw. And it wasn't that horrible. As people started spitting on this guy in a uniform, even though he was protesting. And that got me, uh, you know, it just got me thinking, maybe this is not, for me, the right thing to do. If we can, if we're, we, we're if, if, and this, and it reflects just what's going on here. I'm sorry to get into this. Even I, I told myself I shouldn't, but um, the confusion I had as an 18-year-old marching up Fifth Avenue with all sin sincerity and right intention was, wait a minute, I'm I'm marching for peace, and here we are assaulting someone else. No matter what uniform he was wearing, he could, he could have been dressed as Hitler, and we shouldn't be spitting. Anyway, that was my thinking, and it got me at that younger age to really look closely at, at my own participation. And I will tell you that I never marched again after that. Maybe that's right, maybe that's wrong. But I, and, and I was interested in it. I was interested in social change, but I could never find another group that I wouldn't, that I, I, I felt certain would not act that way because most of the peaceful protest groups were full of very angry people. Makes sense, doesn't it? And I could not understand any of that. In fact, I didn't feel good that I kind of turned my back on something like that because I had a strong association with the peace movement. Um, and all these people are popping in my head as I'm talking about it. And when you take, when you protest against hate with hate, you're not going anywhere. You're just making it worse. And again, so as a, on a personal level, I can never find another organization that that wasn't infiltrated with hate even though they were they were claiming not to be so um <laughs> that, that that that's where a lot of my thoughts came back it brought me right back to 1973 what was occurring then and and just to say that like the buddha told people during his time uh and it's reflected today there's no difference today there's nothing unique or worse about today we're just human beings trying to figure out how to live in the world. And so many of us are rooted in fear and hatred because of that, because of that lack of understanding. Um, we're doing our part today. We spent, uh, well, almost two hours with this long-winded teacher um, talking about understanding as the key to restoring the common peace, calm in the world, but at least um, we understand how to do it with ourselves. So I apologize for the second speech, but I'd like to hear from Kevin. How are you, Kevin? Good. I'm fine, John. I hope you Good can to see you. Um, I was really affected deeply by this sutta and read it many times this week. And I can see that it affected everyone else in a big way as well. And um, it's just, um, I think it's because okay. this is confusion and dilemma with um, an uncertainty is the dilemma we all face from time to time. And we've all faced it. You know, even in meditating this morning with the Sangha, um, I, I was faced with hindrances, etc. And it really is, um, you know, I think it is impermanent, impermanence and not self. Uh, the five clinging aggregates are anatta. And it can stop yeah. us on the path and it can try to knock us off the path. But Buddha really then points to the path and he, he points to these hindrances and he points the way. So we just have to keep following the way. Yeah. That, <laughs> it's it's brilliantly said, Kevin, that we just have thank to keep you. following the way. Thank you, Kevin. Yeah. I'm sorry I interrupted you. No, um, thank you. That was, um, thank you. Yeah, I've been, I, I've been saying this more and more and more uh, over time. It, it is just remarkable what we all as a Sangha uh, understand. Each and every one of you has, has represented the clear understanding of the Dhamma and the, and the benefits of, of, of so. Um, Mike, I don't want to go too long, um, but something came up when you were talking. And would you briefly describe, if you can, this is what I meant. I didn't even ask the question. If this is too personal, just please tell us, tell me it's too personal. Um, your, your awareness of your own life, of what's occurring moment by moment, how has that changed? 
and remember briefly. <laughs> <laughs> How has it changed? Um, well, I, um, I, I think I'm just uh, more aware um, in relation to like a lot of things that I have experienced in my life and uh, I'm not going to go on to get too personal about it, uh, but like uh, I have had some uh, difficulties in my own life as, as we all have, you know, so mine are no different than anyone else's. Um, but I did have a very uh, challenging uh, time last year and uh, I'm not going to get into specifics, but uh, um, I basically, I, I, I almost died last year, you know, um, and uh, I didn't even realize the signs that were leading up to it. Well, basically, I'll tell everyone, I had a heart attack last year, okay? And uh, I was the last person uh, who I ever, you know, I ever thought that would have to experience something like that. And uh, uh, I've always been like, you know, a pretty physical individual. And I worked for a long period of time on the New York City Fire Department. And uh, I thought I was invincible, you know? And, um, um, and so, Again, last year, just before uh, Julie and I had uh, joined the Sangha, uh, I started developing a very, uh, very bad pains in, uh, in my uh, chest, in my uh, sternum area. But of course, uh, you know, being as hard headed as I am, I just basically ignored it for an extended period of time um, to the point of, uh, I, I actually, after, uh, well, I could have died. Uh, the, the doctor had told me that, uh, uh, I, I basically had a pain in my, my chest for about five weeks and, uh, I didn't let it slow me down. Um, uh, but it was, and I told, I had mentioned it to John and I, it was similar to getting hit in the sternum with a hammer and, uh, the pain was, uh, debilitating and, uh, uh, as again, I'm hard headed and stubborn and Julia would, uh, continuously, you know, she was frightened, you know, and, uh, but I wouldn't listen to anybody. And, um, one day she had gone to work and I had woken up and, uh, had woken up a couple of times during the night. And, uh, I was in such pain that, uh, I felt that like if, uh, I could die in that particular moment. So I had to go into the hospital and I had to get a procedure done. Um, but while I was in the hospital also, uh, we had a, um, a situation where, uh, I actually, uh, my blood pressure went down so low that um, I, uh, I, I <laughs> basically, uh, the monitor just went beep, you know, steady. Uh, and Julie was standing there and they, uh, uh, that caused a rapid response. It was like 20, 30 people in a room trying to uh, uh, bring me, uh, get me back to this life, <laughs> which the other life I was experiencing at that time wasn't that bad. <laughs> but, uh, um, so from at that point in, you know, at that point in time, uh, I kind of like started understanding a little better. Um, uh, I became a little bit more aware of, of each moment and, uh, uh, and consciously, uh, tried to maintain presence. And I, I think that's probably the most, uh, the most important thing that's basically, uh, happened to uh, help me uh, gain understanding of life mm. and uh, and mature a bit. Well, I don't know if I'll ever mature, but like uh, um, I think that that probably was it. Um, I think that was it. That kind of brush with uh, uh, the impermanence of uh, who I who I think I am, you know, and uh, and all the mental and uh, formations in my mind. Uh, so I kind of have a, a little bit of a clarity. And I think that's where my perspective comes from when I read, uh, this, you know, the suttas and I and I uh, and uh, <clears throat> come into class in the sangha. So that, I, I think is if I think that's what you're referring to, John. So uh, I hope I've answered your question. Thank you, Michael. Yes, uh, thank you for that personal account too. Um, but that you know that the the. Uh, Again, this the sutta and what we've all talked about. Each and every one of you has talked about practicing the Dhamma the way it's meant to, meaning at the point of contact with the Dhamma, with life. And the Dhamma is our life as our life unfolds. If we have incorporated the Dhamma, and then each and every moment is meaningful, whether it's meaningful in this moment as I move towards awakening, 
or meaningful because I am a fully awakened, fully mature human being. Uh, it's the only way to live, huh? <laughs> uh, all right, I'm looking forward to the uh, to the Salata Sutta in a couple of weeks. So we'll, well, some of us will be back in, in Frenchtown. Uh, it, it's just such an appropriate sutta for this time. Um, we'll have one more class next week virtually. Um, but we're getting back there. Things are changing. Uh, and I will not say that things are changing for the good and they're not changing for the bad. They're just changing. You know, they're changing as they have to. So uh, we'll finish with metta, as we always do. The Buddha's words on metta from the Karaniya Metta Sutta. So find your relaxed meditation posture. Gently close your eyes. Gently close your mouths. And take a moment to be mindful of your in-breath and your out-breath. And these are the Buddha's words on metta from the Karaniya Metta Sutta. This is what should be done by one who is skilled in goodness and who knows the path of peace. Let them be able and upright, straightforward and gentle in speech, humble and not conceited, contented and easily satisfied, unburdened with duties and frugal in their ways, peaceful and calm and wise and skillful, not proud or demanding in nature. Let them not do the slightest thing that the wise would later reprove. Wishing in gladness and in safety, may all beings be at ease. Whatever living beings there may be, whether they are weak or strong, admitting none, the great or the mighty, medium, short or small, the seen and the unseen, those living near and far away, those born and to be born, may all beings be at ease. Let none deceive another or despise any being in any state let none through anger or ill will wish harm upon another. Even as a mother protects with her life her child, her only child, so with a boundless heart should one cherish all living beings. Radiating kindness over the entire world, spreading upwards to the skies and downwards to the depths, outwards and unbounded, freed from hatred and ill will. Whether standing or walking, seated or lying down, free from drowsiness, one should sustain this recollection. This is said to be the sublime abiding. By not holding to fixed views, the pure-hearted one, having clarity of vision, being freed from all sense desires, is not born again into this world. Thank you all for a wonderful class this morning. Stay safe. Peace. Thank you, John. Bye. Thank you. Thank you, John. Bye. Thank you. Thanks for joining. Bye, John. <laughs> Thanks all. Bye. Bye.